Years ago, we were collecting these stories, and one of the stories in particular proved to be very elusive. We kept hearing that there was this restaurant in Illinois that was supposedly haunted, and they advertised it good food and spirits, which I thought, this is a good sense of humor. I like people who have a good sense of humor about life and, and the afterlife. And so uh, we could not find where the restaurant was because it had closed. And we looked and looked and looked, never could find it. Uh, it had been a few years since it closed. And so one day we had three interviews to get ghost stories, and every interview fell through. And I said, you know, let's just take a ride in the country. So we got took, we were all ready to go, got in the car and drove, and we drove over to Illinois, and we drove down these country roads back and forth, just driving down these country roads, and we said, now look, that place, if that, store, if that place is not haunted, it should be haunted. This place looks like a haunted house, like an old hotel. And so we stopped to ask the neighbor, what was the story of this big old vacant place? And they said, that's the old three-mile house that used to be a restaurant where that was the place we'd been looking for for, for a couple of years and had never been able to pinpoint. And it was really tucked away in the country. And we said, well, whatever happened to the family that lived there? And they said, that was the Elliots. And we don't know, they, they moved, the car went up that road and it turned right at the top of the hill. So we went up the hill and just followed down that road and we drove and drove and drove through the Illinois countryside and finally we, we were completely lost and we asked, there was a man cutting grass and so we thought we'd ask him how to find our way home and we stopped and spoke to this man and he said, what are you doing out here? And we said, we were looking for Doug Elliott. He said, why were you looking for Doug Elliott? And we said, do you know Doug Elliott? He said, I'm Doug Elliott. And that's how we met Doug Elliott, who was going to be our storyteller and had lived in the Three Mile House. And we sat underneath a tree and he started telling us the story of this house and his wife came out, Bev, and uh, she started telling the story too. And it took quite a while to get the story, but it was a delightful story. And they told us that they moved into the Three Mile House. It was their dream house. They'd always wanted to own a restaurant. It had been vacant for many years. It had been vacant for nearly 30 years, and it was a lot of work to get this place going. And um, the day they moved in, their daughter, their adolescent daughter, was carrying a box into the basement. And when she walked into the basement, there was a brick on the other side of the basement that lifted up, came across the room, and hit her in the leg. And they had heard that this place was haunted, but they were not particularly believers. They didn't particularly believe in it. But their daughter was just wonderful. And she put this box down and she said, listen, I've heard this place is haunted, but we're moving in here, get over it. This is the way it's going to be. We just have to coexist. She picked up the box of books and just went on. She, that was the way she was. And she was the first person in the family to really start having experiences. And she had many, many experiences. But her parents and her sister just kept saying, it's your imagination, it's not true. She said, no, it's haunted. This place is haunted. This place has a lot of ghosts. And uh, she just was convinced and nobody else was. Uh, eventually, her sister became a believer. And eventually, uh, the mother stopped thinking there's something here. But Doug just absolutely didn't believe in any of this until one night. He was laying in bed. And uh, at, across from the bed, there was this big window where the moonlight would come in and he was laying there and the moonlight was filling the room and he couldn't sleep and all of a sudden the room went completely dark and he thought well, why is the room dark and he looked up and standing at the foot of the bed was this very big black man in overalls and he towered over the bed and he was staring at Doug and Doug thought, somebody's in the house. I don't know this man. He said he felt like somebody was staying on his chest. He thought he was having a heart attack. He could barely breathe. And he watched this man staring at him. And then the man slowly turned to leave. And he walked across the room but went through the door. And Doug was terrified. And he thought, this cannot be a dream. And he kept a gun 
next to his bed, and he got that gun, and he got up, and he went all the way through the house, and every room, every, all the doors, windows, everything was locked. And he sat up the rest of the night with that gun in a chair. And when his wife saw him, when she said, what's the matter? He said, there was a burglar in the house. Somebody was here last night. They were in our room. And she was very frightened. And uh, he said, should we tell our daughters? And they said, well, we have to. We've got to tell them that we've got to be careful. If somebody got in the house, and it was, somehow there must be some way to get in. We don't know. So at breakfast, they said, well, we're not trying to scare you, but we think somebody got in the house last night. Oh my goodness, the daughter, who, well, you know, what did it, you know, how did somebody get in the house? Wasn't it locked up? We locked up. And he said, he said, well, there was this tall black man. He was standing in front of my bed, and, and uh, he, he was so big, he blacked out. The, the room became completely dark, and the one daughter said, oh, Dad, that's Tom. <laughs> I said, what? Said, that's Tom. He's one of the ghosts. He's, he's always here. He's always here. I've told you the place is haunted. He goes, well, you tell him to keep out of our bedroom. We do not want him in our bedroom. She goes, okay, I'll tell him. And so uh, later that week he said, well, <clears throat> did you mention to that Tom fellow to stay out of our bedroom? She goes, oh, Dad, I did. Now, every time he sees you, he runs. She said, he is really afraid of you. And he thought, oh, this is, this is impossible. So then uh, other things started happening. Many, many things started happening. Uh, and one thing that started happening was Doug uh, worked on the railroad, and he kept being late for work because they were trying to restore the house, do the electricity, do the plumbing, trying to get it ready to open as a restaurant. It was a money pit. They were just spending all this money and all this time. And uh, he kept being late for work because he wasn't sleeping, and when he would sleep and oversleep, and finally his boss cut him in and said, look, Doug, you're a great guy, you do a great job, but everybody sees you coming in late. If you're late one more time, you're out of here. We have to fire you. And Doug said, I cannot lose this job. I've got this money pit of this place I'm trying to open up. It, we're months from opening. Uh, I, I can't lose this job. He went home and thought, I'm not going to tell Bev, I'm not going to tell the kids. But he was really worried. And he was so upset and so exhausted he sat in the rocking chair next to the bed he was rocking back and forth and he fell asleep and did not set the alarm so the next morning he was sleeping and he heard he, he heard somebody whisper his name Doug Doug get up get up it's time to get up Doug wake up of awake, but he just could not move. He was so exhausted. Pretty soon, something's tugging on him, and he woke up, and he looked at the clock, and he thought, oh my God, and he ran and got to work. He was still wearing his clothes, and not gotten undressed, and he was on time, and his boss said, oh my God, I can't believe it. Everybody said, hey, Doug's fine. He's fine here on time. Doug finally made it, and I thought, wow, well, I don't know how that happened, but it's a good thing it did. Well, the next night, he got to bed early and stuff like this, but when it was time to wake up, he set the alarm, but the alarm didn't even have to go off because right before he was supposed to wake up, Doug, Doug, wake up. And from then on, every night, he would go to bed, and every morning, he would hear this voice wake him up. It was a young girl's voice. He said it was the most angelic, beautiful voice he had ever heard in his life. And he said, something's in this house some kind of spirit, some kind of ghost, she wakes me every morning. And he became a believer. And after, and eventually they got the restaurant open and it was going. And after a couple of years, it was doing pretty well. And uh, one day he was getting dressed and he said uh, in the, to no one in particular, after she had woke him up, uh, he caught her sealy. That was his pet name for her. He said, Celie, every morning you woke, wake me up and you show me what you look like. I love your voice. I know you're just a child, but just once I'd like to see you. I'd like to really 
see each other. Can you show me what you look like? But he never saw her. But then he heard his door open and close, and the door across the room, the hall open and close. So he ran over, he went in the hall, ran over in his daughter's room. Can I come in? Yeah, come on in, Dad. He goes, did somebody just come in here? And she said, why? She said, I, I just, I, did somebody just come in here? And, she, and the, the daughter said, just a girl that wakes me every morning. Why? Well, he had never told anybody about the voice. He says, what does she look like? He goes, I don't know what he looks like. I don't know what she looks like. She's some young girl. She, she wakes me up every morning. Later, when this restaurant became very famous, and they had psychics from all over the country come here, and they were told it had 11 and a half ghosts. Half a ghost is just something that appears only half of it. That one of the ghosts in the house was a girl named Sarah. And when it was a stagecoach stop, it was her job to wake everybody up to leave in the morning. And he thought, Celie's name is Sarah, and that's who she is. And so he became a believer, and they all became believers. And uh, so each of the ghosts had a very distinct personality. And, and he, uh, Doug and Bev and his two daughters, had wonderful stories, many, many wonderful stories, including the daughter who went to college in Colorado, and the ghost followed her to the college. And then the whole dormitory was haunted by this ghost. And finally, one of the uh, students called and said, Mrs. Elliott, uh, your daughter's got this ghost here. I'm trying to get a term paper done. This ghost is driving me crazy. It keeps fooling around with the computer. I don't know what to do. And she go and she, and 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 she, oh, she said, "Why well, tell you tell that ghost to come home immediately? Mrs. Elliot wants it in this house immediately." Because I should just tell the speak to. I should just say this. I should say it, and it will it will leave you alone. So he went back to his room and he said, "Okay, Mrs. Elliot wants you home now. You go home right now." And this ghost always used to play the piano. When the, the piano lid was down, it would always play the piano. And she heard the piano play, and she thought, oh, that's the one that was missing. And then he called her a few days later and said, you know, that ghost is not here anymore. She goes, I know, he's playing the piano right now. And he wouldn't play the whole thing, but he would just play the keys back and forth. That's when she knew she was there. So things were going pretty well until One night, the one daughter was having friends over in the house, and the parents went into town, and uh, the mom kept thinking, something's the matter, something's the matter, I need to call home, I need to call home, and, and Doug said, they're okay, they're big, they're, oh, they're okay, don't, she said, I got to call, I got to call, I got why haven't they, I, so she called the daughter, and the daughter said, I'm so glad you called, as soon as you left, there started to be a pounding in the walls. And it went up the wall, and it's around the rod. It's in the ceiling. Something is loose in the house. There's a pounding. It sounds like somebody's hitting a bowling ball around the house. So the, they rushed home. They went in the house, and they could hear the sound on the outside, this pounding, bang, bang, bang. They got in the house. It stopped. The daughters were having to sleep over. All the girls went home. They went through the house, nothing was there. They all went to bed. The daughter got in bed. The daughter read the room across from her mom and dad. And she was in bed and she was laying there and she was halfway asleep and she heard somebody. Julie. Julie. Open the window. Open the window. Open the she looked in across the room, there was a face at her window. And she said she was like sleepwalking. She got up and she started walking over to that, open the window, open the window. And she went over to the window and she started to open it up and she thought, nobody could be outside this window. I'm on the third floor. There was no way somebody could be there. And she looked and when she didn't open the window, finger came up and started pulling the putty from the window frame and letting the putty go, open up, let me in. And she looked at the face and she looked again 
And all of a sudden, the face became completely green with red eyes. And she thought, this is evil. This is no dream. I'm awake. And this is evil. And she screamed. And she ran out of the room, across the hall, into her parents' room, jumped in their bed, screamed and screamed that something was trying to get into her room. They got up. They went in there. Nothing was there. So at that time, Washington University in St. Louis had a paranormal psychology department. They went. He said, there was a demon trying to get into your house. He said, this is bad. He said, I'm just surprised that with all the spirits in your house, you were not warned that there was something evil in the neighborhood. And they said, we were warned. That was the pounding. That was our ghost telling us something bad was coming was trying to protect us. So they knew that there was something loose in the neighborhood. And from then on, they were very uneasy. And then one Halloween, they were having a live radio broadcast. And someone brought a Ouija board. And they told them not to bring the Ouija board. They brought the Ouija board. And when they were playing with the Ouija board, these customers, there was an explosion in the kitchen, a very loud explosion. And a man in a dark cape, green face, red eyes, appeared in the kitchen. Dishes went flying. The cooks started screaming. They forced him into the freezer. And all the lights went out. And the radio station was knocked off the air. It was KMOX, one of the largest 50,000 watt radio stations. After that, the Elliots decided they had to move. They were no longer safe in the house. They moved. They lost a fortune. And the restaurant closed. And after they were gone, about six months, the neighbor called and said, come here immediately. The Three Mile House is on fire. If you want to see it before it's gone, come. It's up in flames. And Doug got in the car. And drove all the way there, and the whole place was in flames. And he kept getting as close as possible, and the firefighter said, get back, get back. And he kept getting as close as possible, and he said, he said to the spirits, if you need a home, come home with me. You can live with us. He got in the car after it all was burned and destroyed, went home, laid in bed, thought, now we've lost everything. Now we've lost everything. And just as he was about to fall asleep, he was just heart sick. He heard a very familiar voice. And it was Seely that said, it's going to be OK, Doug. I'm going to stay here.